Hey, I'm Jeff Keeley here in Boston to go behind the scenes to hear some untold stories about the making of Bioshock with Ken Levine and Sean Robertson. Let's talk a bit about the theme and setting of Bioshock, Rapture. Uh, and I think a lot of people, when they played the game for the first time, Ken, they wondered, how did you even dream up this place? And I know you've said publicly before that part of the reason you sort of, what led you to Rapture was this idea of fully simulating a place. Uh, tell us about that sort of idea and the frustrations you had with other games where there, you sort of hit a bound. I think our philosophy is, was always to do what we were doing 100% rather than try to do something bigger and do it 50% or 40%. So one of the ideas of, you know, and this sort of came from System Shock 2 as well, where you focus on an area that you can really bring to life and you kind of eliminate the questions of, well, why can't I go over the bridge to New Jersey? So we were able to really make a place, I think, that felt believable and real, even though in actuality it was really quite limited. But we just sort of dressed it with all these buildings outside that were all, you know, they were all basically glorified fakes. We let the story drive what we needed to show rather than some kind of like predetermined map which we sat down, which is a little different than like System Shock 2 where we actually mapped a spaceship out deck by deck. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't know why the, the philosophy felt a little different there because you want to feel like a real spaceship that was, that was sort of stacked on top of each other. But Rapture was free to sprawl across the ocean floor. Although you guys originally, John, were talking about doing this game on a sort of spaceship again, right? Yeah, when we first started talking about what the spiritual successor to System Shock 2 is going to be, Spaceship came up, but again, you know, we, we wanted a limited environment and we didn't necessarily want to do Spaceship again. And our first actual exploration of this space was underwater, but ultimately ended up looking like a spaceship. It just happened to have a couple of you know, seaweed fronds out, outside. And that started to push us towards uh, what artistic statement that we wanted to make to make this look different and what rules we were going to set for the world. How at every turn we were going to try to remind the player that they were in fact underwater and that this wasn't a spaceship. And how, like, underwater, we obviously know you did underwater, then sitting in the sky, like, what, where did you come up with the idea of, like, doing this underwater? I think there was probably a conversation, it's like, well, w what kind of places could be cut off from, from yeah. other places? Yeah. Like, well, you know, a spaceship, a summer camp, <laughs> uh, you know, like, yeah. any island notion, right? Something that's cut off from the rest of the world. Yeah. So you never felt like you should be able to go over that bridge to New Jersey. I don't want to apply some deep and meaningful conversation. I think it was one of those ideas that you just kind of say, and then everybody's, huh, oh, that well, sounds cool, let's try right, that. Let's, that, let's right. go for it. And, and it, I think it lended itself to having very nice views out the window without having to build an insane amount of unique assets. Right. By today's standards, we still were a small team back then. And there's an expectation that because you're underwater, the view distances are going to be short. So you can really kind of fade out into the fog at a short distance and not have the expectation that, why can't I see forever? So there's a lot of limitations in a good way that we put on ourselves by, by being underwater, as opposed to like, if you're on a cruise ship, then you'd expect to see across the water and we'd have to deal with that. Same thing with an island. Or in the outdoor in the sky. Where yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which was a lot more complicated. Yeah. yeah. So you, you came up with the idea of let's do this underwater, let's do this sort of isolated place. Then you had to answer the question of, you know, why would someone build this? Is that sort of how it worked, sort of order of operations? You then had to come up with a story to explain? Yeah, uh, it, I think the, we wanted a very believable reason why they'd be there. Right. And sort of the, the necessary isolation of, of the place sort of led to, well, what kind of person would want to do this? And um, I wasn't even particularly aware of the sort of the political implications of what I was reading, but I've been reading, um, I had read The Fountainhead. Right. Um, by Ayn Rand, and I mostly thought it was an interesting story. Like, I didn't realize that people were sort of basing their sort of political mm -hmm. lives around it, because yeah. um, I wasn't that tuned in to that stuff at that point. And so, but I love the, the dialogue and the kind of speechifying in it, because it, you can see a video game character yeah. speaking with that kind of certainty and that kind of confident um, philosophy. It just seemed like a, a natural, a natural kind of thing to apply to, to this place, and so it just sort of all came together as a very, as a sort of a, a, a who is the guy who would do this? Well, right. 
you know, that character. Um, it was sort of this amalgamation of characters from Ayn Rand's books and from Ayn Rand herself. This sort of idealistic person who says, well, the only way to do this is to separate from the rest of the world. And that led to Andrew Ryan. I am Andrew Ryan, and I'm here to ask you a question. Is a man not entitled to the sweat of his brow? No, says the man in Washington, it belongs to the poor. No, says the man in the Vatican, it belongs to God. No, says the man in Moscow, it belongs to everyone. We knew from a technical standpoint that we wanted isolation. We also knew to sell it, we needed a compelling storyline, a backstory that why would this place exist? Otherwise, how are we going to make Rapture feel like it's lived in if we don't have the reason for it to be there? So w once, once we decided on the underwater location and then the closed off spaces, that objectivist story kind of came in and came in and made, and made the art stronger and made the level design stronger because we could feed back into that loop. And I think that's why we had to have sort of Andrew Ryan's pitch right at the beginning of the game. We wanted people to understand why somebody would go there. And so was, he makes this very personal one-to-one -one pitch to the gamer, but also that was the pitch he made to people, yeah. which was, you know, there's a place that you can be free of all these things, where you can not be sort of put upon by the government and not be afraid of nuclear war and not be afraid of all these other things that um, will plague you on the surface. And we wanted that pitch to sort of resonate and make sense because that's otherwise by the time you got there you'd be like well this place is just fantasy nobody would ever come here and that the beauty of the place also is also tied into that it had to be a very attractive proposition or people who would believe that people would go leave their lives and go to the bottom of the ocean i'm sure in some ways you had to convince the team and enroll them in your sort of vision of you know who this character was going to be and what the setting was going to be. How, how did that work, Sean? I mean, did Ken come in and say, hey, I've been reading these books, and I think we could sort of... I believe he just came in one day on a, on a horse and said, <laughs> and ran, everybody read The Fountainhead. Exactly. I bought 30 uh, copies of it. Yeah, I, I think, you here's know... A seven, here's a 2,000-page book or something. Yeah. Go, go read it. I mean, it really is more organic. It, you know, like I said, we knew that we had this location, and you struggle to fill it with stories, and you struggle to find meaning of why... Why does this place exist? You know, what's my motivation? And as Ken started to explore Ayn Rand um, a little more and started talking to us about it, and we ha were having that conversation, and it's like, oh, this could totally work. Like, this is exciting. Like, this is something that really hasn't been done in a video game before. And if we had flipped it and come up with the idea first before the location, I don't think we would have really been that excited about it. But we had a location. And now we're trying to fill it with, with that story. And, and because of the order of operation there, you start to get excited, like, oh, I could totally make this work. This, this, this is going to uh, really make it feel like a lived-in space. You know, as you think of sort of the, you know, the setting and you think of maybe a character or something, was there a moment that you, you think back, it's like, oh, like right then and there, like I, I got excited when you attached the For, for me, it was, going, it. it was going to Rockefeller Center yeah. um, and seeing the visual. Uh -huh. so I, you know, I told this story before, but I, my wife and I were in New York, and we went to Rockefeller Center, which was, if you go to Rockefeller Center, it basically looks exactly like Rapture. It's because yeah. every building, you're sort of encircled. It's this block in New York, or a couple of blocks in New York, where Radio City Music Hall is, and um, where 30 Rockefeller Plaza is, where you see that show 30 Rock, and the ice skating rink, and where they put the Christmas tree. And it's this very iconic location, but what's cool about it, it's all one, unlike the rest of the city, everywhere you look, it's one um, architectural style. It's Art Deco. And it's very iconic Art Deco. And my wife and I were there and we were sort of working on the game and we didn't have a visual style. And all of a sudden I started looking around and I said, oh, oh this could be a visual for the game. Also, it was, the geometry of it was actually quite conducive to making a video game because it wasn't overly complicated geometry. Art Deco is quite bold and simple. Bold and yeah. geometric, yeah, and simple. And so my wife and I bought a couple of tourist cameras before, this was before iPhone right, cameras, exactly. you know? Throwaway cameras. Yeah, yeah throwaway cameras, those yeah. little Kodak things. And we just started photographing doorknobs and light fixtures and just sort of brought, we, you know, developed the photos. Remember that? Um, yeah. Brought them in and said, Tell like, the officers a stack of stuff, a Sean. Stack of photos. Take a look. I'll see you guys in a couple of years. Go, go make this. City where the artist would not be in sense of where the scientists would not be bound by petty morality, where the great would not be constrained by the small, and where 
the sweat of your brow, rapture can become your city as well. So you had kind of a, a theme, you came up with an art style, some of the iconic characters, and then you know you really had to build the narrative around it. Um, and you've talked about you know a lot of the, the themes in the game and you know greed, jealousy, sex, violence, all the things that sort of you know drive us or what destroy us. And that was something I think that you know as you thought about the, the story of the game, you wanted to I'm sure reflect some of those, right? Because I think people love the characters that sort of flawed in a way, and this is a a, a world which is its own little microcosm, but had a lot of tension inside of it. Yeah, I mean, the character of Ryan was sort of, um, he, he's basically invisible through most of the game, right? You know, except for a very small portion. But he's very present because he exists, the city is him, right? You know, it's such a representation of him. We never want to cut away to a cutscene where you saw Andrew Ryan, you know, planning and scheming. We, we wanted him to be very present without actually being present. But once you had Ryan, or once you had his desire to protect this vision of his, you had a, you just had to then come up with the characters who'd be arrayed in opposition to him. So we had this character, the Big Daddy, and then eventually the character of the Little Sister. And so characters like Tenenbaum came along. Like, you know, here's a person who's in opposition to him for this reason. And then yeah. you have, you know, for more noble reasons. And then you have a character like Atlas, who's much more cynical yeah. opposition. Once we had all those characters arrayed, we're like, well, who are you? And, you know, you ended up being a sort of, you know, a pawn in the middle of this, of all this opposition to Ryan. We just kept kind of homing in on that theme and making you, making sure that you weren't, you know, eventually figuring out that you couldn't just be here by an accident, that you, that you're an integral part of what this story, even though you don't know you're an integral part of this story, you, you think you're just there by happenstance. Look, Mr. Bubbles, it's an angel. I can see light coming from his belly. Wait a minute, he's still breathing. It's all right. I know he'll be an angel soon. 